All right, boys and girls, the funnest part of any home improvement project is, of course, demo day. Uh, make sure that you're safe. Use goggles, gloves, uh, boots. Uh, as you see, my wife decided to be a little too cute and uh, didn't put shoes on for the first couple of hits against the wall. That's on her, but she's safe now. Uh, and then make sure you kill the power. Uh, you don't want to have power running through that room. You don't want to hit any of the cables and create a disaster there. So once that's done, it's helpful to pre-cut a lot of the sections you'll be breaking down. That way it doesn't demo way too much stuff and creating more problems laying down the road and then find the biggest hammer you got and then start whacking everything down and let your imagination roam free see that blank canvas that you're creating all right so for the framing now if i could advise you to focus on one specific section of this build more so than any other section i would say it's the framing it's your foundation if you screw up this part you're gonna have so many issues customizing every little piece after this and troubleshooting and fixing problems. So take your time, make sure your walls are nice, straight, they're upright. And the most important part is if you have transition pieces like I do here, where one side of the railing comes one way and then it pivots and turns. It creates a very difficult way to connect the two together when it comes to putting trim, when it comes to putting the metal railing on top. So figure and plan the stuff out. I kind of regret not putting a little step down section, maybe four inches deep or wide, and then continuing it again. It probably saved me so much hassle, but that's my advice to you. Learn from my mistake. The nice thing is we got everything figured out. Now for the drywall, drywall typically comes at your hardware stores in a quarter inch, three eighths, half inch, and a five eighths. Make sure you take a little piece out of your wall to kind of see the thickness that you're gonna have. That will make it easier to mud later down the road. In my situation, it was a half inch drywall, nothing fancy. The best way I figured out to do drywall cut cutouts is uh, take a piece of paper and draw out the shape and then measure from every side to every corner and then come out in your garage and then start tracing that exact pattern out. When it comes to speeding up the process of cutting, use your utility blade with a straight edge, kind of like a level in this situation, on the white part and then flip it over and crack it and it'll break exactly perfectly on that line. It's really fascinating, it's a lot of fun and it works a lot better than just using one of those drywall knives. All right, all the drywalls hung up using the screws, but for the corners, I actually recommend using the drywall nails, mostly because the head on the nail is flush and flat, makes it a lot easier to apply the, the joining compound on top of that and it won't interfere in the way. Now for the actual taping of the joints on the drywall, you're gonna need a few tools. You're gonna need a six inch joining knife, a 10 inch taping knife, and a 14 inch plaster trowel itself. If you wanna get a hawk and spend extra money, that's a little plate that you can put the compound on. It makes it a lot easier, but you can get a Way with it doing it a different way when it comes to mixing the content itself it's the all-purpose joint compound and you want to get it to the consistency of ketchup being on a trowel essentially so add some water there mix it up and you're ready to go apply a first coat into the joints themselves and then lay the tape down on top this is your drywall tape follow the drywall tape with your drywall taping knife with a skim coat of the compound applying onto it. Let that sucker dry overnight. Once it's dry, come out, sand it a little bit, and then start applying a wider section onto that taping part. So sand all the edges with 150 grit sandpaper using a pole sander. Once that's done, you're ready to apply a skim coat of the actual texture. In my situation, I have the knockdown. You might have the orange peel. Two applications are very different. So kind of do your research to see what's the best technique to get the texture that you have, and then you're ready to paint. All right, here's a harsh reality for you. Your drywall is not straight, and no part of your house is gonna have a perfectly straight drywall line, and so you kind of have to anticipate your stairs being the same way. So every tread, in a sense, has to be almost like a perfect customizable cut. Now, to make this process a little bit easier, I've created a little multi-measuring tool, if you will, and basically all I did is I did two little rip cuts on the back of the two extra piece of laminate flooring that I had that had little locking grooves in it. And so I would basically line the width of the actual stair tread that I would need, and I'd clamp it together using a little clamp. I will then bring this custom measurement over to my actual stair tread, which is roughly around 94 inches long. They're nice and long to accommodate the majority of stairs that are out there. I would make my marking and then bring it to my miter saw to create the finishing cut using a 42 blade on my miter saw. 
After the cut, I would do a dry fit ensuring that there's no gap larger than a 16th of an inch on each side. That way, the 16th of an inch can be concealed using caulk. Once the fit was perfect, I would then lay down a zigzag pattern of liquid nail adhesive, install the actual tread itself using a mallet on the corners of the nose, and slowly but surely pushing it in, not rushing the process or else the nose will snap off on you. Now for the trim work, I found that the budget alternative to picking up individual pieces of pre-finished trim is buying a four x eight sheet of high density MDF at your local hardware store. They're about 30 bucks a sheet. I actually end up only needing one sheet for the entire project, including the staircase risers and the trim. I just ripped it with my track saw. You can always use a straight edge and a circular saw or your table saw. I secured everything using glue and nails and then make sure to go through everything using the putty to fill all the holes in, sand them nicely to have them all pre-finished. Now when it comes to painting, the second piece of advice I'll give you when working with MDF is that includes taking an extra step where you have to prime it first. If you do what I did and what a lot of people do is they just put a lot of extra coats of the paint and primer together, well the MDF ends up sucking it in, the first couple of coats, uh, kind of like a sponge and you just see it transparent through. So to save yourself to do minimal amount of layers, put one or two layers down of primer first and then you'll only need one or two layers of the paint itself. When it comes to achieving a good crisp painting line, I have a professional painter giving this little tip where he said to mask it off first and put a beat down of paintable caulk spread it around with your finger and then put a fresh coat of paint down. And before the caulk or the paint dries, take the piece of tape carefully off and then you will see that crisp line. The downfall is if you let it dry too long, you'll end up seeing that line more of a jaggedy. So that's a little tip I learned from him and hopefully it'll help you guys. For the risers, I use a remainder of my MDF pieces and I've custom cut all the individual risers using that custom measuring tool that I've created for the stair treads and I created each individual piece custom tailored to each step. On the back of it, I actually wrote the step number, one through 16. I place a piece of tape wrapping around the bottom part of the stair tread itself, making it easy for me to remove those pieces after all of them had the perfect dry fit. Once everything is done, I brought it to the garage and I've created this pattern. I don't know what to call it. I don't know if it's a, a halfway between herringbone and chevron, but it really does look cool. It's not an original idea, but this is how I did it. I used my Craig table saw sled, set the miter to 30 degrees, and I've created these quarter inch deep grooves. I then flipped the piece over and created the same one on the other side and then one straight 90 degree line down the middle. Once all my cuts were made and everything was ready for painting, right before I laid down the paint and primer, what I did is I took a piece of sandpaper, 150 grit, folded it in half, and went through each channel little groove one or two stroke at a time, mostly because when it comes to painting, I believe a lot of the little fibrous materials in the wood will start rising and it won't be as crisp and sharp. So take a little time, do a little bit of sanding inside of it. It's not a lot of work, just so you can get it knocked out in just a few minutes. When it comes to actually painting, this time I laid down the one or two coats of primer and then I finished it off with a hyper white two coats, I believe is all it took. And it turned out so much faster and such a better finish than when I did the trim work on my steps. Once the paint was dry, the installation of the staircase risers couldn't have gone smoother than it did. And I think that's because we took the time to custom number all the risers on the back tailored to the exact destination on the stairs themselves. So when the time has come, all I had to do is put a couple of beads of silicone on the back of each riser, set it in place and secure it using three brad nails. Once the brad nails were done throughout the risers, all I had to do is go back, put a light coat of putty into all the holes, touch it up with the exact paint that was left from the riser's paint. And then right after that, I just finished doing all the baseboards around the staircase and I'm ready to start working on the actual railing. For the railing, the first parts I wanna start with is actually the posts themselves. And so the first step is to figure out the, the angle that the post would be sitting. So all I took was a T-bevel and I attached a magnetic small little level to it. Once I found the actual true center of the upright of it, I then found out the angle to be what it needed to be using a protractor. And then I started cutting things away using a diamond blade with my chops off for the metal. For the actual materials that I used, it was the 065 
wall thickness, which is basically an eighth of an inch thick when it comes to steel. The posts themselves were two by two. The top of the railing was a two by one. And then the each individual little slats, if you will, they're running down horizontally were a half inch by half inch material. Now, due to the nature of the railing where it kind of angles and pivots different directions, I knew that it wasn't realistic for me to build in my garage and then try to assemble it and make it work in my house. So my best execution was to install the post upright first, make sure they're nice and straight, and then tack welding each individual piece into its secure place. It allowed for me to make sure that everything didn't move and everything lined up exactly where I needed to be. I used a welding blanket below my surface that I was working at to make sure the little splatter and sparks didn't catch my house on fire and didn't damage all the hard work that we're already put in. Once everything's secure, me and my wife took everything off, brought it into my garage, and then I finished everything off with good strong welding beads. In the garage, once all the welding and grinding was done, I was ready to start uh, degreasing. I degreased it with the acetone to make sure that none of the oils and greases interfere with the finishing color that we're gonna put on it. Now, originally, my plan was to powder coat these railings, and honestly, it was just way too expensive to do so, so I decided to give it more of a DIY approach. And being metal, I decided to kind of treat it like a car and what a car would withstand its durability. So, I first put down an automotive self-etching primer. It's a primer that we put down on the bare metal of the car before paint goes on it. Once the primer was on, I was ready to start putting the paint. And for the paint, again, I stuck on the automotive side and I used a Rust-Oleum automotive matte black finish paint. They advertise this stuff for automotive spoilers and, and hoods and stuff like that. So I knew that I was willing to withstand some of the environments on the outside of the house than they are on the inside of the house. So 